Hello, everyone. My name is Luis Proshnov, and I am the Brazil Program Director for the International Plant Nutrition Institute. Let me welcome everyone for today's webinar. Today's webinar is a joint session between IPNI headquarters and IPNI in Brazil. Always remember that IPNI has different webinars throughout the year. If you want to know about our webinars, please access ipni.net or specifically for Brazil, you can access brazil.ipni.net. Farmers and crop consultants are being exposed to so many tools, so many techniques that it's never too much to reveal that we need agriculture based on science. And this is our topic today with the title Evidence-Based Agriculture. Our speaker today is Dr. Rob Norton, a researcher and educator with amazing achievements. At the end of 2017, Dr. Rob Norton retired as the IPNI Regional Director for Australia and New Zealand. Prior to IPNI, he worked as a researcher and teaching academic at the University of Melbourne, focusing on crop agronomy, soil science, and crop adaptation, including the supervision of nearly 20 post-grad students. He has published over 140 book chapters, refereed journal and conference papers, as well as nearly 350 other technical reports and extension articles. He is currently involved in business and agronomic projects in Australia and internationally. So Dr. Rob Norton, it's a great pleasure to have you. Thanks a lot for attending our invitation. And please, you can start your webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Proshnow, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, present on this very important topic. Uh, having evidence and science behind what we do is, I believe, fundamental to the future progress of agriculture. I do have a, 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 an introduction which talks about what do we mean, what is evidence-based agriculture? Well, the term comes from uh, a term that was evolved in the mid-90s called evidence-based medicine. And evidence-based me medicine is about using evidence from well-run clinical trials to make decisions about the care of individual patients. Now that sounds like something that we would think would be done anyway, uh, but in fact, the use of clinical, uh, the use of uh, experimental data in clinical practice used to be uh, not very common. And in fact, experience-based medicine appeared before evidence-based medicine. and Prior to EBM, evidence-based medicine, clinical practice was largely based on experience and judgment. Even now, not everything is based in medicine on evidence because we don't have a complete evidence base for all clinical practices. However, we have moved beyond uh, the principle of balancing the four humours, which was very common in Greek and Roman medicine. Um, I think we've uh, moved on from that, hopefully. So why, uh, Dr. Proshnow mentioned a little bit about this, why would we even think about um, having to emphasize the importance of science? Well, we are bombarded with science through the media. Uh, we've got uh, the greatest skin care and hair care products. We've got new sports shoes and, and sports drinks that will increase our sporting performance. Uh, we've got dietary supplements, we've got things to put in our fuel tank, 
to improve fuel economy in our car. We've got all the little gadgets around the house and around the home and the garden that will help us improve what we do. The question is, is that science? And people in white coats present a lot of that information. Is it science or is it pseudoscience? And in our agricultural region, in our agricultural area, we often get asked, I get often asked if this product works, that is, is it, does it have an effect? Is it efficient? Is it effective? Unfortunately, the quality of in information that some organisations pr present as proof or as science is poor and the evidence is weak and misleading. The situation for fertilisers is somewhat different to the situation for other products. For example, in Australia, agricultural and pesticides and veterinary medicines are regulated and reg registered and regulated through a through a controlling organisation. Um, our grain types are <coughs> are registered and tested through a national variety testing scheme. But for fertilizers and soil amendments, there are safety uh, procedures in place about registration of what's in the bags and what's in the uh, fertilizers, but efficacy is largely unscrutinized um, at, a, at a national level or at a, uh, a scientific level. And this means, this to me indicates that we need uh, uh, evidence if we're going to use some of these products. For an example, as an example, who would believe it? The pile of buffalo skulls on the right or the uh, fossilised uh, coprolites um, in the bottom uh, right. If you took those bones of fossilised dinosaurs or animal bones or rocks and treated them with oil of vitriol, you put that on the soil, and 100 kilograms of that material was a, could be equivalent in crop response to 400 kilograms of farmyard manure. Well, in our modern society, we may very well say, was the oil extracting the nature, natural and life-giving essence of the dead animals and transmitting it to the soil to improve the performance of the crop? Well, that's one possible explanation, but more likely, it's because what we've just described is the process of acidulation, the process where a single superphosphate is manufactured. The oil of vitriol is in fact sulfuric acid. The bones and later uh, used rock phosphate is insoluble phosphorus, and the acid converts that uh, uh, insoluble phosphorus to soluble and plant available phosphorus. And so the response we see uh, is uh, is due to the increase in available phosphorus. So there is a very rational and a very good scientific explanation for what happens. But the next question is, does it does it provide a response? Well, the people who developed this process of acidulation was a guy, was a gentleman called uh, John Bennett Laws, who was a country squire at Harpenden, and he had developed this process of converting bones into uh, soluble phosphorus. And in combination with um, uh, Joseph Gilbert, who was a chemist, they set out in 1843 to see if this product actually worked. They established a, a field experiment, a broad bulk, which was uh, Laws' um, family property in 1843. And that Try, that uh, experiment has been farmed continuously since then, 175 years, which is the uh, which is now at the Rothamsted Research Station. They wanted to establish if chemical sources of fertilisers were as good as farmyard manure. So this was an experimental procedure to test um, the new product. And this is what uh, broad bulk looks like. Um, it's a large field subdivided into different treatments such as farmyard manure, a nil control, some different rates of nitrogen, some different uh, macronutrients for, and across those treatments are different farming systems, different rotations. And that experiment, as I said, has been this year has been running for 175 years, which is a remarkable, um, a remarkable place to visit if you're an agronomist or in fact if you
who are interested in agriculture and sustainable uh, farming. This, the results from this just quickly uh, indicate that the there is a, a response, a significant response to uh, those chemical fertilisers and in the continuous wheat, for example, um, farmyard manure and phosphorus and potassium fertilisers with additional nitrogen was at least equivalent, maybe a little better than farmyard manure over the whole duration of that experiment. And if you then had better varieties, better um, cultural practices, such as in a rotation, um, farmyard manure needed some additional nitrogen to meet the best uh, NPK fertilizer treatments. So this was some, this is evidence of taking the ideas into practice, testing those with science, and then importantly, reapplying that good science back to uh, practice in uh, food production and, and agriculture. It's Rothamsted's 175th year, and um, if you'd like to see more about that experiment, you can uh, look at the look at the whole data set uh, at the website indicated uh, in the top of the, the screen. So when we talk about evidence, then that's one example of evidence. What do we mean? What do we mean? What do we as scientists look for? Well, what we what we often see as evidence and paraded as evidence is, is self-promotion. The developer of the new product will get up there and spruik how good their material is and how it works in all situations and it's uh, very cheap and very effective. Or we might get endorsements. Some famous people might promote the use of uh, this material, the sportsman promoting the use of a, a new fertilizer. That would be a of little, uh, little interest to the sportsman other than the uh, endorsement itself. Or the testimonials from users, you know, farmers for example, or agronomists. The question is, is, is that product more likely to provide a benefit if it's endorsed by someone? If somebody is uh, from Brazil, for example, would that make a difference if uh, they wore a Brazilian football jersey or an Australian football jersey or a Argentinian football jersey in that uh, promotion. I would say it would be interesting, but it probably wouldn't have any uh, difference, make any difference in the effectiveness of the materials. One point about endorsement is is that under our current law in Australia, which I'll mention in the next uh, next slide, if something's endorsed, if a if a user endorses it as a testimonial or somebody who's a famous person, it's expected that that person has had uh, intimate knowledge and used that product. And um, we've had situations in Australia where uh, endorsements have been challenged in our legal system because the, used, the promoters and the endorsers haven't actually used the product. So if someone's endorsing a fertilizer or a herbicide, they really need to be a, uh, a farmer or an agronomist who's had first-hand um, interactions. There used to be a term in Latin which was caveat emptor and that term tells us that the buyer should beware. The buyer, it's the buyer's problem if when you sell them a used car, fill the gearbox up with banana skins, and drive the car out, as soon as it leaves the lot, it's the buyer's problem. But that used to be the situation but it no longer applies. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission does not agree with this caveat emptor, the buyer beware. And I'm sure in most other jurisdictions there's similar uh, organisations overseeing the concept of truth in advertising. That is, if something is uh, promoted as having an effect of doing something, it should be doing it. Truth in advertising is the underlying principle uh, in, that's embedded now in Australian consumer law and it's managed through uh, a commission, a government supported commission called the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission which covers all consumer products including, including um, legal services and so on uh, and in agri there's actually an agricultural commissioner a gentleman called uh, Mr Mick Keogh who oversees 
the truth in advertising as it relates to uh, agricultural uh, practices and agricultural uh, the agricultural industry in general. So the underlying principle of that is that the law guarantees that the product must be safe, durable, free from defects, fit for purpose, acceptable in appearance, and match its description. So that's the key is to match its description. If you say that something works, then it should work. If something gives a response uh, in a crop, it should give a response in a crop. There have been uh, examples of uh, false and misleading representations. Uh, for example, uh, things like a negative iron mats that are sold. Uh, there was a legal legal case against those uh, requesting evidence. Uh, no evidence was forthcoming. So it was considered that that was uh, an untrue representation of the, the benefits. There's been many other examples. Unfortunately, there's been many other examples of um, the ACCC um, investigating organisations about false and misleading representations. These principles flow into a whole lot of other places. So for example, uh, we've had the situation in Australia where we've had the sale of products such as organic water. Now I don't know about you, but I'm not certain what organic water is. Um, the claim that the organisation selling organic water was uh, was that the, the uh, water came from farms that were farmed organically. Um, the ACCC said, no, you, it's not organic water because it's water. It's just, it's water. That's all it is. Um, you can't have organic water. Um, so uh, there, there's no longer availability of uh, organic bottles of organic water. You just have to have water. And so those products have gone off the market. But of course, in a marketing sense, uh, a new product will come in and fill that niche, something new. And in this case, uh, we've had the appearance of a diet water. Now, again, I'm not sure what diet water is, but certainly it's uh, true that it's it's um, got no calories, but whether that's any different to any other sort of water, I'm not sure. So what does science consider as evidence? The basis of good science is to see if there's a real difference, a real and repeatable difference occurs when we impose different treatments. For example, we always know that five is more than three, but is that difference between those two numbers consistent? Will it occur every time? Or was it just by chance? We know that biological data from field experiments is variable. You know, the yield map up in the top right corner makes that very obvious that uh, we have high levels of variability in fields and that might be due to soil, it might be due to microclimate, it might be due to um, some other factors. Most often that data is normally distributed, that is it means there's some very high numbers, some very high yields like the uh, dark green and some very low yields uh, like the red and most of those yields in that yield map should be in the light yellow, uh, light green, yellow or orange. And that is really the normal part of the field. Most of those should be in the middle. And we would describe that as a normal value as where two thirds of the values lie within um, the area either side of the mean. And that's what this little blue distribution tells us. The mean is the red line here, and one and two thirds of the values lie within what we call one standard deviation from the mean. So one standard deviation that way, one standard deviation that way. The other thing about this uh, description is that the mean in this case, the mean of the data, which is the average, uh, is the same as the median, and the median is the middle value. Now, if you look at the yield map up on the top right, you can see that there's in fact more red dots than there are dark green dots. So there's more lower yielding areas than higher yielding areas. So this is in fact, distribution is not normal. It's in fact what we call a skewed distribution, where we have relatively more 
low values and the middle value, the median value, is actually to the left of the, uh, to the, is, is, is lower than the mean value. So normally we would treat the data as a, as a symmetric rather than a skewed left or right distribution. We can mathematically, we can uh, change these skewed distributions to a normal distribution using some mathematical uh, adjustments. Now I sort of need to flesh this out and I'm sorry for the statistics but it's statistics that are often quoted when we think about differences and it's what we need to know. So if we go back to this field and, and let's, uh, for argument's sake, let's ignore the fact that it's a skewed distribution and say we've normalised it, which the normalised corn yields are given in that diagram. So the mean yield from that field is 6.7 tonnes per hectare. The standard deviation either side of the mean, where 67, 68% of the values occur, is between 6.1 and 7.3. So 68% of those dots are between 6.1 and 7.3. And that's one standard deviation, or in this case, 0.6 tonnes per hectare. And that's what we would consider to be the normal range for that field. If we looked at 95% of the, the dots, and we went out this time to two standard deviations. So this is now 1.2 tons either side of the mean, we're actually still in a, in a range that is not unreasonable uh, and that two standard deviations takes us from 5.5 to 7.9 tons per hectare and we'd call this the reference range for that field. And so that when we describe this field, the, the, in fact the yield, the normal yield or the reference yield is between five and a half and nearly eight tonnes per hectare. And 95% of all those values occur in that, in that, in that range. Two and a half percent occur higher, two and a half percent occur lower. And we have 95% confidence that the yield falls within the range that is on that, uh, that graph. This process of drawing up um, this distribution was first done by a gentleman in Ireland uh, who uh, worked for the Guinness Breweries and he published a method to describe a population rather than just the mean to describe a population um, and he said you could, he developed a method where you could test if a value was within um, or, with, or outside the confidence limits for a population. And that is what is called the student's t-test. It was called the student's t-test because he published uh, a lot of his work under the, under the pseudonym of a student. This, that work led to describing biological systems like farm, farm fields as distributions, not as single numbers. And we know that just going back to that yield map. And the distribution might be a uh, very uh, narrow distribution where you've got a small standard deviation. It might be a very broad distribution where the standard deviation is a lot larger relative to the mean. In a typical field experiment, uh, given the experiences I've had, that a typical field experiment, the coefficient of variation, which is the ratio of that uh, standard deviation to the mean, is, a, is usually around 5% or, or smaller than that. So that means the normal range, say for a three tonne per hectare yield, is plus or minus 0.15 tonnes per hectare. In the lower figure, the CV, the coefficient of variation, might be 15%. So the mean's the same, but the normal yield is three tonnes plus or minus half a tonne. So 95% of the values uh, would occur within between 2.05 and 2.95 tonnes per hectare. So that's a fairly big range if we're trying to make an assessment of a difference within that field. In science, we're often uh, think about comparing two sets of variable values. and if we had two distributions such as 
uh, no fertiliser on the left and fertiliser on the right and the distributions of those, what we'd be interested in testing in a science sense is, are they different? Are they, is that two groups or is it just one distribution? And the contribution that Ronald Fisher made, who was a, a statistician both at Rotham, Rothamsted Research Station, he published a technique in uh, the 1900s, 1920s, to describe how you would make that test. And that's what's called the Fisher test or the Fisher, T te uh, Fisher F test. And what he looked at was what was the sample standard deviation. If you looked at recalculating that as the whole distribution, what was the whole, dist what was the standard deviation of the group? And he described the ratio of these derived, st a derivation from these standard deviations as the F ratio and where that F ratio, that F and F test, F being for Fisher, uh, what the ratio of that variance is, means is if that's a very large ratio, that is if the group deviation is large and the sample deviation is small, then we could make the assessment that those populations are different. I apologise for the the, bio, the 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 statistics, but it is important to understand that there's variation. We compare the variation between and within groups to make the assessment of a true difference. If these groups move together, the sample standard deviation stays the same, but the group deviation becomes smaller. So the group variance decreases, so the ratio of the variances or the F test just decreases. If that ratio is small, then we consider that these two populations to actually be one population and Fisher developed a set of probability tables to give chances that those values were the same. And the chance of being the same is an important term because we, that F statistic is a probability. It's a chance, it's a bet. It gives us the odds of the means being the same. In many cases in science, we settle for the odds of 20 to one, um, which is important to express this in this way. That's a 5% chance of being wrong. 5% chance of being wrong. It's not necessarily a 95% chance of being right, but it's a 5% chance of being wrong. And we say it's being wrong because when in science, we start with the null hypothesis. We start with the premise that there's no difference and we try to prove, ourself, prove that hypothesis wrong. And that's a bit of the reverse of what often happens in a lot of situations where where the experiments are trying to prove something is correct or something has a response. Um, we would start off with the premise that it's being, that um, we're trying to prove that there is no difference. That 95% uh, probability, 5% probability fits on a scale in all evidence. So if we were in, a, in common law, if we were, um, going up before a judge and, and jury, the guilt or well, the effect would need to be pro, uh, uh, proved beyond reasonable doubt. And that's where the jury comes in and makes an assessment of whether there's significant issues there. If it was a civil case, it's not beyond reasonable doubt, it's, beyond, it's in the balance of probabilities and that might be 51% chance. In science, we sometimes hang our hat on 95%, but we might be equally willing to hang our hat on the effect of, of 10 to one, or we might be more confident and say it was 100 to one. The key to that, making that assessment of chance and probability and differences is to have a, a concrete way of testing um, how that data is collected. So I've got seven, R's that I'd like to mention as we go through. The first is the, 
the reference that the data we collect is referenced and we have an appropriate set of appropriate controls we have a test we have nil and we have a district practice so this blue is what we're testing nothing and then what might be the normal fertilizer practice and that's what we call appropriate controls or referenced controls we would then replicate these experiments so we would account, try and account for that normal variations in the field by repeating the series of treatments across the field. Now it might be done in blocks or it might be done, uh, how many replications, sorry, depends on three things. How variable is the trait? If it's very variable, we might need a lot of replications. How small is the difference that you want to measure? And how certain you want to be of results? Now often we would uh, settle for four replications. Uh, sometimes that will only give us a very low chance of getting a, a difference. We would also think about randomising these the, to account for the neighbours. So we've got the normal blocked, what we would see blocked, or we might have it as a completely randomised design, where in this case, in the blocked design, the same treatments occur together but in different orders. Um, in this case they're randomised right across. This blocking is the traditional uh, strategy for doing field experiments. Referenced, replicated, randomised and repeatable. The important thing about the science is if we did it again, if we did this experiment again, would we get the same thing? And <clears throat> If you do one experiment, there's a 5% chance you were wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. So you would need to repeat that in different environments, uh, maybe with different crops, uh, to assess the responses uh, across a wider uh, agroecological set of agroecological zones. Repeatability is an important one because the throwaway line is anybody can win the lottery. You can do an experiment and get a result, a, uh, a significant difference, um, a five percent chance of being of getting that uh, result. Um, but we we in agriculture need to be confident about giving recommendations across soil types over years, maybe with different crops. And I suppose the key to re for repeatability is to make sure that the research is field based, is local and is well designed and they're the key things that we would look at with uh, repeatability in terms of field experiments. And the other question is how if uh, one field experiment is being reported how many other experiments where there was no significant difference are not reported so sometimes um, we end up losing uh, data along the way. Randomised field experiments are not the only way to collect evidence. Uh, for example, we might link sets of observations such as in the graphic here where um, uh, two sets of uh, observations are linked and um, there's proof attached to those sets of observations. This is what we call correlation and correlation is the relationship. How good is the relationship between the data? How good is it? And it's assessed by what we call a correlation a coefficient, an R value, which is between minus one and one. The R values here, there's no relationship between the data. In that case, in this case, there's a, there's a strong positive correlation. And in this case, there's a strong negative correlation. And then there's variation between uh, those values in terms of the strength of the relationship. We can fit a mathematical expression to that relationship uh, where we think that there's causality, that is one has caused the other, an independent variable such as fertiliser and a dependent variable such as yield. Uh, we can develop a relationship, a mathematical relationship that has a strength which is the correlation coefficient and we can have a, an expression of that usually if it's a line, if it's a linear expression uh, with regression coefficients, which is where the intercept is and what the slope is. And both of those numbers have errors around them as well, which relate to the 
co uh, correlation coefficient. And in fact, those errors are in, as in, in A and B are as important as the actual numbers themselves. It may be curvilinear, it may be, we might use multiple regressions, but in, in essence, what we're doing is trying to develop uh, a relationship between two factors. This uh, is often a bit of a slippery slope. For example, if we, we could in fact uh, look at the data between shark attacks and the number of ice cream sold, and the data in the little graph there implies that uh, ice cream sales, increasing ice cream sales cause shark attacks. Uh, now that's an issue that we often see uh, with correlation studies and where information is correlated or related but there's no causality. There's no cause for one to, on the other. There might be an explanation and the explanation might be when it's hot more people eat ice creams and also go swimming. When more people go swimming the higher the chance of a shark attack. But one doesn't necessarily cause the other. So a lot of the science that relates to uh, this information is using the evidence that we've collected to make a fifth R, a reasonable explanation of what we've seen. And the key question to ask is, does that, does that make sense? Does it make sense? Does the product claim it's special or unique? Um, in terms of crop nutrition products, if yields raise, the nutrition nutrients that are in, embedded in the crop in terms of increased yield have to come from somewhere. We can't just make things appear. We can't have miracles occur. There always has to be a mechanism and a predictability of the actions. And this is where the science comes in compared to, paras, uh, to pseudoscience. We look for cause and effect. One thing we look at is, um, a very old um, saying was uh, a term called Occam's razor, which an Occam uh, razor says that if basically if you're faced with two alternatives, take the one that's simpler, that has the fewest assumptions. So don't try and make a more complex explanation out of something that can be relatively simply explained, such as our first example where phosphorus versus the miracle life essence of the old uh, dinosaur bones. What else do we mean? Well, once we've got that, we need to, we should be reporting that. And it's reported in various publications from using reporting labs and fields and glass houses. And the fifth, the seventh R is that that report goes into a peer reviewed journal publication. And there's many of them, and there's a hierarchy within those publications. Some are highly uh, uh, highly cited. That means the, the information in them is used widely. Um, a, a conference publication may or may not be reviewed. A uh, conference publication um, is certainly at a, a lower standard, a much lower standard than a peer-reviewed journal uh, publication, and uh, depends with what the journal public journal is where the information's been pu published. We might also review that as a body of work and there's review journals that are quite commonly used. So those seven R's are the, are the basis of what I call and what we're considering to be evidence-based agriculture, which is evidence based on experiments, that there's reasons for the ob observations and we can make predictions about where else the effects can occur. The thing that we're faced with in, in agriculture now is not that there's too little evidence. Unfortunately, in some cases there is, but often there's too much evidence. Um, since um, 1950, it's been estimated that there's been 60 million scientific articles and there's about two and a half million journal articles each year. How do we make sense of that? Well, there's the current uh, strategy is uh, to do, undertake what are called systematic reviews. And systematic reviews are a search of all relevant experimental data and then um, use, those, use that information 
to develop some embedded truth. And in fact, most uh, science now would be encouraged to publish the data itself, and there are journals such as on the on the uh, bottom of the screen where you can publish the data itself from your experiments. So it then, it can then be combined with data from other experiments into what we call a meta-analysis. And basically, a meta-analysis hoovers up all the data with a systematic review, and then uses uh, some mathematical techniques to tease out the common truths within those similar scientific studies. And it's certainly become a very powerful way of evaluating um, information and uh, adds incredible value to the data that we do in, in field work. An example, um, we did some work looking at uh, high carbon dioxide effects on, on yield. We looked at 108 papers. Uh, we presented the meta-analysis in this form, which is no effect uh, from all those experiments versus um, an effect, a 30% yield increase in grain yield due to elevated carbon dioxide. And it was different among different nitrogen statuses and among different plants. So that tends to be the way that data now is being uh, aggregated and presented. How should we not present the results? Well, if we did a field experiment and we got the yields like this, three and a half tonne, 3.9 tonne, and we're comparing a new product, which we find has a 4.1% yield, uh, we might be tempted to draw a graph something like this, or we might be even tempted to, to amend that so that the normal increases are as a percentage of the, um, of the uh, actual control and the product here and the headline for that would be that there's a 5% increase over normal practice using this product. A couple of things, well firstly you can see here that the, the scales on the graph have been stretched and the second thing is that there's no indication of error. What's really different? The way we would prefer to present that is either as a table with an assessment of error or as a little tick mark on the top of the bars or if you're going to have an extended a, a stretched uh, scale you can uh, still have those tick marks and that tells us what is really different the least significant difference at five percent chance of being wrong um, that tells us that if we look at those bars uh, that the overlap tells us that the normal and the 308 are higher than the highest variation in the nil, but the, there's overlap between this blue and the pink bar graph. And that comes up, if we look at here, the least significant difference is 0.3, 3.5 to 3.9 is 0.4 tonnes per hectare more, so that's a significant difference. And But 3.9 and 4.1 falls within the common range. And so that increase is not true. We might also notate that in this way as A, B and B. So where the common letters are common, there's no significant difference. Unfortunately, in some experiments, in some reports, uh, there's ways that this information is stretched, the friendship stretched, just as comparing results that are not statistically different. So even though 3.9 and 4.1 tonnes are not different, there's an example there where um, the extra $5 purports to give an extra $40 per hectare. But that's not true because those are both the same population. Well, equally, we might uh, compare unequal application rates as being equal. So 10 tonnes per hectare of this at five litres is of product X, 10 tonne per hectare with a 25% decline uh, in product Y. Uh, so that the, the same yield has come from um, less product Y, 
but unfortunately again they're exactly the same yields and we've got no basis on which to uh, make that evaluation and so that's also uh, stretching the friendship. Or we might compare products without a soil test. So 400 bush bushels of apples using 50 mils of some product versus 400 bushels of apples, same yield using normal applications. The conclusion could be that product X replaces the whole of the normal fertilizer application project. But if the soil fertility is, is high enough, then neither of those things would have had an effect. So we need controls. <coughs> so that also is stretching the friendship. So when we evaluate evidence from as science or pseudoscience, what we're thinking about is evidence from trials that are referenced, replicated, randomized, repeatable, reasonable, reported, and refereed. We need to test ourselves. We need to be skeptical. As a farmer, it's their dollars that, that are being invested. As an advisor, it's your reputation about the recommendations that you're giving and as a business it's your future if you're investing in a product that is not going to provide a sustainable uh, benefit to growers. And the key question is how do you know that? How do you know that what is being shown to you is true? And that's where you have to go back uh, to the data, have to go back and demand that there's evidence provided from good trials that are referenced that have all those seven R's embedded. And that's where the difference between science and pseudoscience is. One of the key important in pseudo, a difference between true science and pseudoscience is this idea that we're actually willing to change our opinions. And John Maynard Keynes, who was one of the most important economists was challenged when he went to a press conference and made a statement that was in contradiction to one he made a short time before. And when he was challenged by a journalist as to why he changed his mind, he said, when the facts change, I change my mind. And he challenged the journalist back. And what do you do, sir? Do you just, in effect, do you just keep your fixed ideas or are you willing to change? And there's a whole nother set of uh, criteria that we would look at, peer review, um, whether we've got selective presentation, whether we're open to criticism, whether we can verify the results. The reason we go through and give such detail about the methods is that somebody else can then go away and repeat them. Do we, is a product claim to have limitations or is it claimed to work everywhere? And I think they're, they're the key things we would be looking for when comparing science to pseudoscience. But there is an important point to make, is that we need to be skeptical, but we also need to be willing to change our mind, as I said. The illiterate, Alvin Toffler, who wrote a book called Future Shock, said that the illiterate of the future are not those who can't read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. That is, be open, be skeptical, but look for the evidence, uh, just as poor old Daisy the cow here has had to have her views uh, reassigned um, when a flying saucer landed on her. So as our industry, our agricultural industries, what we should aim to do is pride itself on the good science-based data that we develop. You know, think about those seven R's. We should be objective about that information. We should be questioning it, not accepting it. We shouldn't have to resort to litigation to resolve issues of efficacy. And we shouldn't have to revert to the small print. The sign on the right emphasizes that the sign has some problems. It's got sharp edges and you shouldn't touch it. But in fact, the main message which is hidden below is that the bridge is out ahead. So we shouldn't have to revert to the small print. What we see should be the most important message. And that's too important um, to leave to chance because we're, uh, we're a precious planet that re requires the best science to feed the 9 billion by 2050. And uh, leaving that to pseudoscience is not a, a viable option. So with that, thank you for your attention. Um, 
and uh, I'll hand back uh, to Lewis, who might care to uh, moderate if there's any questions. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Rob Norton. This was uh, an excellent presentation. In fact, we have several compliments uh, from those that are asking questions, so just great. So we'll go to the questions now, and we have several. We do have about 10 minutes for the questions. So let me ask the first one, which is, what can we do to encourage farmers to question what they are told when they often don't have time or the skill to investigate validity? Please, Dr. Martin. Well, it's, that's actually a behavioral issue, isn't it? Um, I think in many cases, what we need to do is work at a level up because as we know, farmers are incredibly busy and they, but they also rely on the, the, um, their advisors or uh, their suppliers about the information that's being provided. Now, the, the ultimate is to legislate about that truth in advertising uh, and make sure that what's been um, promoted is actually what's true. Now, that's, I'd hate to add another layer of legislation. And in Australia, what we've been working on is what's called FERT care accreditation, uh, which you can see, which is managed through Fertilisers Australia. And that is a situation much like the, um, much like the um, uh, certified crop advisor program in the US where um, advisors are given the tools to make decisions about data which then they can provide to growers. So I think there's, there's that way, but you know, it, it never ceases to amaze me that, you know, farmers will use a product uh, that's got no testing um, and and spend a lot of money on it uh, based on what they think is a, should be a response. Um, so all we can do is ask the farmers to demand the evidence, not just to ask for it, to demand the evidence because they're paying for it. Uh, so we have another question. Uh... I would like to know if there is a good maximum coefficient of variation to be considered in a field experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, um, I mentioned the national variety trials um, in Australia, uh, crop varieties are tested and somewhere between, if, if a trial coefficient of variation is more than 8%, eight or 10% off the top matter. If it's of that range, then that trial's not included um, in, the, in the overall analysis because it's considered to be too variable. Uh, you know, if we go back to that 10%, uh, the three tonne per hectare yield, a 10% coefficient of variation says that the normal yield uh, would be, be, be between uh, three point, um, no, 2.4 and 3.6. Now that's not a very precise level of uh, confidence that we'd have in that uh, information. So four, four or five percent is a good, three, four, five percent is a good field experiment. Eight, nine, ten percent is not a very good field experiment because there's too much variation. Too difficult to make the assessment of a true difference. Okay, uh, thank you. There is another question related to statistics, which is uh, generally, probability is usage uh, of one or five percent in agronomic trials. Um, can we work with 10 percent in your opinion in this uh, type of trials? Uh, I have to have to confess that in my PhD one important part of it was I was only able to ascribe a, a 10 percent or actually eight um, percent confidence level so yes you can you can do that but underlying that uh, that assumption that that assessment has to be a very strong and reasoned argument in the same way even at five percent a strong and reasoned argument based on a cause and effect is as important as that five percent 
I mean, 5% is a 20 to 1 bet um, that you're wrong. Um, so the probability just tells us, it doesn't tell us whether it's right or right, it tells us what the chance is of us being wrong. And so, you know, certainly you can, if you come clean and say what the probability is, then I think that's as a, a good strategy, in fact, a better strategy than claiming even that a 5% or 1% probability is, is uh, the, the truth. In fact, the reasoned argument is more important than the probability. Okay, so we have a question if you have a recommended reference so they can use in this topic. Uh, very good. Um, the, there is a, uh, a, a centre for evidence-based agriculture based at Harpenden uh, University in, in the UK. Uh, but in terms of, you know, we go back to statistics, I suppose, um, as being the basis for making some of these assessments. And to be honest, I, also, I get confused by a lot of the statistics too. But um, I, I think IPNI has been publishing a couple of um, articles about uh, evidence-based agriculture. I know I've written two that have been on the back page um, identifying what the issues are and how we should uh, approach them. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity to uh, do a bit more. We've been, in Australia, I've been, this talk or a, a shorter version of it, I've given maybe 50 times through that FERT care program uh, to advisors and growers across Australia. So I think, you know, the, the talk that I'm giving is going to be available. It's available on the ANZ website for Australia. It's also, this presentation will also be on the, um, on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. So I think there's a couple of references, but maybe there's certainly more, uh, a need for more um, concrete uh, publications about this area. All right, so we have other questions, but we are running out of time. So you can always contact Dr. Rob Norton, I'm sure, to, to further discuss questions with him. Um, you know, when we first thought about this webinar, uh, it's because here in Brazil, and I'm sure many, many other locations in the world, the farmers and crop consultants are being completely inundated with so many options and we doubt uh, the proof of uh, the needed science uh, behind it. So um, we thought about Dr. Rob Norton and really I'm glad uh, that he was able to deliver this speech for us because it was right on target what we initially thought. So. There are so many compliments, Dr. Robert Norton, um, Rob Norton, for your your webinar. So I want to take this opportunity to really thank you very much for your contribution. It is one that will not be forgotten. So I thank everybody um, attendance to the webinar. Thanks again, Dr. Rob Norton. I'll leave the floor you. to you, Dr. Norton, in case you want to make a final comment. Thanks, thanks uh, Dr. Proshnow. It's, a, it's always a, a pleasure to uh, give this talk because it, it, science is fundamental to us and um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share share some of my ideas. So thanks for that, uh, Dr. Proshnow. So thank you again and thanks everyone for attending the webinar and see you in the next one. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.